on the workbench, I have, this is a black and white analog monitor type that would have been used in security cameras. I actually use this thing here as a clock and I have, it displays the time. It used to be used as a security monitor at one point. We've lost horizontal deflection. And I have a little uh, program. I'm just using a Raspberry Pi basically to generate time and it puts it on a video signal and it but kind of looks cool when I get it going. It's kind of a unique conversation piece. It's kind of like that oscilloscope clock that I've got sitting up in the, the shop here. Along the same lines as this clock, this one here uses the XY inputs of an oscilloscope and just generates the time. Well, the other one, it generated somewhere, it's done through software, but it's output as a video signal and I'm just using a little Raspberry Pi uh, uh, to generate that video signal. Anyway, as you can see, we have no deflection. So let's get, let's get this uh, unit apart and we'll see what's gone wrong. And I can pretty much assure you it's a capacitor that's gone bad in the horizontal deflection circuit. So in this case, we'll be using Mr. Oscilloscope to find the problem. Industrial equipment is always designed for ease of service. This unit was made back in 1988 and it was actually part of my security system for, for years until I upgraded to color equipment and then it just kind of became redundant but all of these industrial monitors were designed for ease of use they were designed to be running 24 hours a day, 7 days a week and if they broke down they were designed to be easily serviced by the service technician so that they could get them back up and running because again they were designed for security use so even the bottom cover it just comes off with a couple of screws and then you're in like Flynn as they say so looking at the bottom of the circuit scary huh stick my fingers in here with the power on and get myself a good jolt uh, there is high voltage uh, the unit itself operates pretty much off 12 volts there's the transformer here so the whole unit actually is isolated uh, this is your mains transformer but you do have 10,000 volts coming off the flyback transformer which is right down here so this generates 10,000 volts DC to the high voltage cap on the picture tube that's your second anode voltage we're going to we're going to uh, flip this thing over here and uh, we'll get in here and just do some voltage and waveform measurements just to see where we're losing our signal Got to get the eyeball help on here so I can see this. So looking at the circuitry, I just know from the layout, here's our horizontal uh, output here. This is our flyback transformer over here. So this is our horizontal circuit. I have to figure out this is our power supply. The rectifier is right down here. This is our AC to DC rectifier. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at the circuitry and see if I can figure out what is what? Now I know that the horizontal output is going to be a, a large transistor compared to the other signal transistors and it's going to be mounted on a heat sink. So if I look back at the top of it again, I see that there's a big transistor that's right, right here mounted on this heat sink. And this is more than likely going to be the horizontal output transistor. I can pretty much guarantee that that, that horizontal output transistor there is going to drive the transformer and I look down at the deflection yoke to see where the deflection yoke is plugged in. And if I look down the deflection yoke, I can see the white green wires are plugged into here, which is more than likely the vertical circuit, and that would make that the vertical output I see. And the red black wire is plugged into another plug that's back here. So the red black, I'm going to guess, is the horizontal deflection yoke. And I can confirm that if I look on the board here. It says. H D Y horizontal deflection yoke right there if we follow these traces we'll see that one side of the deflection yoke here it's gonna get something to point with one side goes along 
It comes over here to this little coil. This is going to be the horizontal width coil. And from here, it goes along through the coil, goes through L602, and follow it all the way back here, and it's going to end up, you guys can't see it, so I'm going to point it, I'm going to zoom the camera back. So here we are. We follow this trace along. This is our horizontal pulse. You'll see that it goes, where are we here? Along here. Follows this way. Continues up. Ends up right here on the collector of our horizontal output transistor. So, if I put my scope here on this coil, I should have a horizontal pulse going to my yoke. So let's do that. Let's turn on the scope. And again, I need to remind people if you're going to be hooking up a scope, make sure that you are isolated from ground because if this is a hot chassis and you were to hook up your scope probe to it, you're going to have major sparks. I am plugged into an isolation transformer and there's a transformer on board here. And this is a three-pronged ground, grounded cord. So we know that this chassis is going to be grounded, but for safety's sake, be on an isolation transformer. It just makes your life that much more safer. Okay, so uh, I was going to scope right down to about here. I'm just going to change the... I know it's going to be a higher voltage pulse, so I'm going to take my scope. First of all, I'm going to put my probe in the times 10 position, not the times 1. That gives me a good working voltage on the scope. It gives me 600 volts. Uh, well, it gives me more than that because I'm on a times 10 probe. But uh, my, my scope is, is uh, 10 volts per division, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It's about 100 volts full deflection uh, on 10 volts. And then with the times 10 probe, that'll give me 1,000 volts. So I can actually look at a 1,000 volt peak here. So turn on the power, and I'll turn on the monitor, and we'll see that, yes, we have a signal here. We can lock the scope in, and it's going to trigger it here. There we go. It's triggered. There is our horizontal pulse. Looks real nice, doesn't it? So we know we have a horizontal pulse that's going through this coil, and that horizontal pulse is making it over to the horizontal plug for the yoke. The other side of the plug, aha, it's making it through the yoke. If we follow that circuitry, it goes to this big ass capacitor here. Well, it's not really a big ass capacitor. It's a, it's a big capacitor. It's not a very high value. It's, I think it's 6.8 microfarads maybe. It's all it is. It's pretty small. Look on the other side of the capacitor and we have nothing. We've got a pulse there. We got nothing over here. Let's take out this capacitor and take a look at it. I bet you that our problem is this capacitor has gone open. So once again, I have the power turned off so that I'm not going to get jolted here. And I'm just going to heat up and remove by rocking and removing this capacitor. Here's our capacitor here. And is it 10 or 6.8 or 4.6? It's a 6.8, 50 volt. But here's something very unique. This is a non-polarized capacitor. Notice that there's no negative terminal. And it tells me it's a bipolar capacitor. See, it's a BP, a bipolar capacitor. Which means you can't just put an electrolytic in its place because as we know electrolytic capacitors like this one here which is a dead one but they have a positive and a negative terminal and a bipolar capacitor does not so what are we going to do are we going to get a bipolar capacitor yeah that's that's an option i can do that but did you know that I can make a bipolar capacitor? Yes, I can. Out of a regular capacitor, I can make a bipolar capacitor. Well, actually, out of two regular capacitors, I can make a bipolar capacitor. What I need to do is I need to find two capacitors that, when placed in series, will equal the desired capacity. 6.8 microfarads. Now, Unlike resistors, if you put a resistor in series, say for example you put two 10 ohm resistors in series, you would have a 20 ohm resistor. If you put 
two 10 ohm resistors in parallel, you would have a five ohm resistor. Capacitors work exactly the opposite. With a capacitor, if you put two 10 microfarad capacitors in parallel, you would have 20 microfarads. If you put two 10 microfarad capacitors in series, you would have five microfarads. But the unique thing about capacitors, electrolytic capacitors is, if you put two capacitors in series and you connect the two negative terminals together, so we connect the two negatives together like that, the two positive terminals become your non-polarized electrodes. So I'm going to go find a couple. I need six point. Uh, what did I say? I need. I need six point eight microfarads. Capacitors, you can be a little bit high. So if I put a couple of, um, if I put say two twenty-two microfarad capacitors in series, that will give me. And this is a fifty volt one. So. Again, I, I can go 50 volts, I can even go lower though, I can go 35 volts because when you put them in series you double your voltage, right? So a couple of 22s or even a couple of 50, couple 15s probably if I've got them, but again, it's, it's, it's not that important. You can go a little higher and all it'll do is give me a little more drive and make the picture a little bit wider and I can always cut that back with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, the width coil. So. Let me find a couple capacitors. We'll put a couple of them in series. I'll tack it on here and show you that it will work. For the sake of this demonstration, because I don't have the exact value of capacitor, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the right one for this monitor before I put it back into full service, but I want to demonstrate that it will work. So I've got a couple 33 microfarad, 450 volt capacitors. We will put these in the circuit. And I'm just going to tack, tack them in on the bottom here and I'll show you that it does actually work. So I've got the two negative terminals, as you can see, connected together, and I'm just going to solder those two together. Now I'm just going to tack these in on the bottom side of the board because they're not going to be staying in here permanently. They'll be coming back out when I get the right cap to put in. I just want to demonstrate that this actually will work. So there's one to that pad. There's the other one to the other pad there. Okay, we'll turn it on. I now have the video line coming from my little time generator, and as you can see, there we have it. It's returned. We have our horizontal hole control. It's going to lock in there. It's a little bit unstable. It's probably because the controls are a bit dirty. But there you go. There's my monitor fixed. I love it. I have this uh, Raspberry Pi feeding into a modulator and have it set throughout my house on an unused channel and uh, ah, have music playing from my satellite dish and uh, just leave it on, you know, as a giant clock. Don't want to do that on the plasma TVs though, that's not good for them, it'll burn them, but on the LCD TVs it is great. Anyway, uh, there you go, that's how you fix a no deflection problem on an analog monitor. Keep it, just take a look, keep, look for the big non-polarized capacitor they do go bad and go kaboom like this one did. Well, it didn't go kaboom, it just stopped working. And the thing is, they'll work fine until they stop working. This was working fine up until a few hours ago. I walked into my office and, oh, the monitor's gone dead. Perfect bonus, I can make a video of it right now. So um, there you go, it's back in service. I'm going to get the right size apart just for size constraints and put it back in there, but uh, that's it. I fixed it! I thought maybe maybe you guys might like to see what the waveform looks like on both sides of that capacitor now that it's working because you saw that with the waveform what it looked like when it wasn't working so we'll hook the scope back up here and I'll just pull the camera back so you can see both the scope and the monitor at the same time and uh, we'll just take some measurements so 
I was looking at that the uh, coil before. Remember what the waveform looked like? Well, now you see the difference in the waveform. It's a different shape. The other one had a kind of a double dip. Here's the other side of it. Okay, here's the capacitor. It goes in. It goes in here. Where are we? It goes through the coil. There, that was what it was. If you look at the capacitor, before we had a waveform on one side and we didn't on the other, that capacitor is grounding. That's the ground side for the uh, deflection yoke. So before I had waveform on both sides of the deflection yoke, now I don't have a waveform at all. If I, if I turn up the gain here, we'll see. I have to really bring the gain up because the voltage is very low. One side of this capacitor is grounded and the other side goes to the coil. But you can see what it did to the waveform from when it was open. So I can show you that again. Here's what the normal waveform looks like. If I open up that side, the, the bottom of it, if I open up the one side like we had with the bad cap, you'll see what the waveform does differently. So I'm gonna shut it off here and I'll just open the one side of the capacitor. For that matter, I'll just take the thing right out because I'm going to be getting the right one for it anyway. Now if I turn it back on, you'll see the difference. See that? If I bring the gain down, that was bad. So, and that's going right to the deflection yoke, the other side of the deflection yoke. So that's how I get checked that out, and you can see here, that's what I saw. That's what I saw when it went bad. If I had left it for any length of time like that, I would, have had a nice, I would have had a nice black line burned up and down the screen. So, that's the horizontal deflection of one of these little monitors. Maybe it will give you a, a, a crash course on the vertical deflection on one of these monitors when I uh, get around to uh, doing that. But uh, that's the horizontal section. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye.